Hello and welcome to Kushti TV, the Straight Talking YouTube channel. Yes, as promised, guest today, um, better late than never. I actually had him in my studio, we've done an interview, listen to this, and <laughs> we lost the footage, so <laughs> called for a little bit of a giggle. But as promised, he's here today. Yes, the gentleman in question come from humble working class background to make it hugely successful as a businessman, yes, a self-made entrepreneur. But um, he wasn't intent on that. He left that life behind when he retired and settled down. He went into a lifelong passion of writing and very, very successful he was. And we're going to reveal the books that he's done and the extraordinary people he's met. Yes, the wonderful life that this gentleman has had. And he's going to tell it right here on Kushti TV. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. It is, of course, the very one and only Mr. Martin Knight. Welcome, sir. Thank How you. are we? Yeah, I'm very good, thank you. Jolly good, jolly good. So, um, Martin, yes, we're gonna. I'm gonna go back. Um, <coughs> tell us about those humble working class background. Tell us where it all happened. That let's tell the viewer at home how we started. Yeah, I was born on um, a small council estate in Yall in Surrey um, in the at the end of the 1950s. I suppose it was a fairly austere. Uh, times, but you, di you didn't know it at the time because you didn't know any different. We never went without food or anything like that. I wouldn't yeah. even claim that, but you know. So, my, my mum and dad um, worked in libraries, that's where they met in a public library, um, which I think probably gave me my love of books, reading them. Yeah. And um, we had uh, six children at one point, um, and it was a, a sort of mixed race family because my mum and dad fostered and adopted children. So I had a Barbadian brother, a West Indian brother, a, a, a Jamaican sister. Um, among my uh, other siblings, and um, I suppose that was unusual for the time. Certainly unusual in Epsom. Yeah. Uh, and that was it. But we had, I had a lovely childhood. It was a great, great time, and uh, um, yeah, I wouldn't change it for the world. Brilliant. Well, that sounds absolutely fine because I, I mean it, it's it's mentioned in life, <coughs> isn't it? Uh, what's installed from an early age. Yeah. very often comes out in us so so you had good installments there and um you knew what it was like to in an era of odd jobs work for money mum and dad on you know limited amount and so you really learn from an early age i take it how to appreciate a pound oh yeah without a doubt so the, t the town you come from epson in surrey is just southwest of london as i know it i still have london accents and it's um, i think it's about 12, 14 miles yeah, 14, from the city centre. 14 miles. 14 miles just southwest of the city centre. And I think it's now um, a Greater London Council, isn't it? Is it? I'm not sure. I'm oh, not sure. Okay. Anyway, but well, that's big to differ. But for the viewers who ain't familiar, you might be from up north or whatever. Um, and that's where it is, you know. You might not be, you might be abroad, you might be America. I've got Canadian um, fans out there, which, which I'm very grateful for. Um, yeah, but it's just southwest of London. Now, I'm going to use a term that I'm not going to use. It was commonly used. Um, I actually heard this on national radio. They deemed, and, and now I don't think they'll be able to say it, but they deemed Epsom Looney Town because it was owned, the biggest in the UK owned to mental asylums. Is that correct? Now, Looney Town, now we look at it, it's blessed and us poor people with mental health difficulties needing help, but they used to get away with that. And I'm not saying that, I'm getting this correct. It's a town um, for mental asylums. It was the biggest in the UK. But um, on a light, lighter hearted side of things, there was some beyond beyond away from these asylums, there's some quite loony stuff going on um, in every day in your school uh, example. I've read one of your books and I want to touch on, I find it quite fascinating. There used to be a thing called Police Five. Explain it, um, the instance with the school and the... No, with the, uh, the school across the road from us, which is not the school I went to, a, lo a local kid who, who we all knew, burnt it down, or he burnt down a, a big chunk of it. And I'm sitting there on a Sunday afternoon with my mum and dad, and I'm, I imagine I was about nine, something like that, and uh, Shaw Taylor, who everyone knew at the time, keep him peeled with his catchphrase keep them peeled for your younger viewers um that was a police five it was a bit like a crime watch of today yes <coughs> so yeah. he, he said uh <coughs> he's talking about the school and all that and he's saying you know, if anyone's got any information they could come forward 
And I said to my mum and dad, oh, I know who did that. <laughs> Quite casually. <laughs> casually, yeah. And uh, my dad said, what? <laughs> I said, I know who did that. And I said the boy's name. He said, you can't go around saying things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you learn from an early age that um, there's some strange things going on in your town. Yeah. And you learn not to be a grass from an early age. He was uh, the old man told you. <laughs> not well, yeah, well, he probably thought I'd making it up, but I wasn't. Oh, <laughs> you meant it? Yeah. yeah of course. And it, is it? Everyone it, it, it was strange. That bloke went on to be not a nutty serial killer. The bloke who burnt the school down. It wasn't a serial killer, but he ended up killing killing a guy with a Kalashnikov rifle. Yeah. So I'm glad I didn't. And nearly killing another one. I believe he was shooting at random out. He had held a sort of block of flats. He was holding off from the police and. Firing his gun at people. So, want for the right him. word, common language, he was in that case. Off his uh, head. Yeah, he was. Took his own life eventually? He, he died through oh, alcohol. Oh, he died, did he? Okay. So, um, well, in the nicest way, it sounded like he should have been in one of the asylums. Which many yeah, people I mean, should, many criminals should, have, should be in there. People but said they that. Know, about, they don't people, die on those. People said that about Epson. There was more nutcases on the outside than there was on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was one of them. He, he yeah. may have been, yeah. <laughs> So, so moving on, tell us about um, what became this very successful um, financial career. Tell us how it all started. What was your first job? Well, when I, when, <coughs> excuse me, when I left school, um, I did, didn't come out with any qualifications. I didn't take any, really, to speak of. And uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. All I knew is what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to work on a building site. I didn't want to work in a factory. Um, I wasn't very good with my hands. I wasn't going to be doing an apprenticeship. So I'm sitting there, you know, doing nothing, and my dad was very patient, and uh, he come in one day, I think I'd been out of work, or not, not started work for about two months or yeah. something like that, and of course in those days they needed your housekeeping, your parents. Of course. They, need, they needed so As you get bigger, you eat more, yeah, and it's quite exactly. a natural cycle. So, like you know, this. there was a bit of pressure there. Anyway, he'd come in with a, something he ripped out the paper, and it said a messenger boy wanted at the Financial Times. Right. So I said, I said well, what does that mean then? He said, I said, what does a messenger boy do? He said, well, I think they deliver messages, don't they? I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I went there, and that's what it was. I was a messenger boy delivering the post around, around the building to the journalists. And, and yeah. Whatever. And um, that was that. And I worked there, uh, work, work, worked my way up a little bit, I suppose. And uh, after about 12 years, I, when I would have been 27, 28, I got the opportunity to go and work in a... A bank in Bahrain. It was, it, was a, it was a bit of a con, really, because it was setting up a computer system. Yeah. Uh, information system. Oh, and when you say a bit of a con, con on on on, on your job description or, well, or on your I, application? I, my former manager at the Financial Times had gone out there. Right. Basically, had said, I, "I know a bloke that can do this role," but I couldn't do the role because I had never switched a computer on. Right. They, they, they were in their infancy. The internet wasn't out. And uh, he said, oh, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And I remember sitting on the plane to Bahrain, reading the a manual for a thing called DBase 3, which right. was a software package, which is the one they were using. Yeah. You know, I had no experience with all this, I just read this manual. <laughs> you get some knowledge and, on and, the and, way, yeah. And, and got a little bit of knowledge on the way, and of course my manager would be covering for me a bit, but you know, I was exposed, but I blagged it and uh, stayed there for a year or two earning very good money that's yeah. obviously why we went um it was you know four or five times what i was earning in england really with, without tax oh yeah so if, if you're doing a, a just basic average wage of today 36k or something maybe 40k your times that's 200 of, of that that's a basic yeah, it wasn't average like that. i think i, I uh, the, the the equivalence was i think i was earning 15 grand a year in england and i went out there on 60 Tax free, something like that. So that's four and a bit, four and tax free. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you've got five times, something. yeah, something like that. Yeah, right? I mean, it, it basically, um, I'm not you, very good at maths, but I know the basic numbers. You get a hundred pound a day, and somebody give you five hundred. Yeah, it was, that's, oh, that's, 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 that's good wages suddenly. Yeah, and, and the other thing was there wasn't really much to spend it on. No, it was an Arab country. I mean, you could drink in Bahrain, but you couldn't do it overtly. Really, you know, it wasn't a done thing. Um, so really, your, your, your social life consisted of going to each other's houses, which got a bit tiresome. And I got a bit bored, to be honest with you. I got lots of money stacking up. The money was stacking up. Yeah. Um, and I got a bit bored and uh, I went back and joined a business I started up just before I went. I left it with my partner. And um, I went back after a year, year and a year and a bit. and. Uh, we, we started up this press cuttings agency, mm -hmm. or it became a press cuttings agency. And I don't know if you know what that is, but basically 
very quickly in those days before the internet we would buy every new newspaper in the country every new paper we could lay our hands on yeah the inverness courier down to the cornwall gazette or whatever and we worked for people like paul mccartney paul mccartney did become one of our clients um i'll just use him as an example and every time he was mentioned we cut the article out stick it on a bit of paper send it to his house in rye and he would pay us a pound of cutting all right so in a year that wings to it or whoever band he was in at the time um you know you could you could uh, paul mccartney might be spending a thousand pounds a month with you yeah you get a thousand cuttings on it yeah you know and 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 then mainly the real money came from doing banks and big companies corporate britain really so he just wanted to know what was being said about well, yeah. i.e. new building uh, finances uh, yeah whatever uh, anything anything if yeah. anything yeah so 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 there you go you, you cut out a press cut then and that's google with scissors google with scissors yeah. changing times but that was made very successful well it did but what didn't happen straight away i mean we had lots of ups and downs i, mean, I, had, a, I had a partner i had a couple of partners um we had recessions to deal with and there I remember there were times when I had to uh, remortgage the house to keep the company going. So there were some tough times. Some tough you times. got you got the bowl of fruit um, at the end of it. The what is the word they commonly use? The fruits of hard labour. You reward. You, you were rewarded. You reaped all of those. You had a nice big juicy bowl. You were very successful. Congratulations on that. But it wasn't a bit of roses. It was very near close to. Yeah, I going mean, the other way was it? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So it, I suppose it's like a fight in life, isn't it? Life, you've got to stay in that fight and you've got to be dogged and you've got to roll in. I always say, I say it in sport, because I come from a golf and a boxing background, um, and I think it's a bit like life. It's easy to smile when you made a par or birdie on a golf hole. It's easy to be happy in a boxing ring when you're just sticking a left jab in somebody's face. But when they put it on you, it's different. And you've got to roll through that. And if you're not able to roll through that, you might as well get out of those careers. And I suppose it's a bit like life, isn't it? Like your business. If you're yeah. not able to take that on the chin as a businessman, if you're an employee, yeah. if you're an em employed by somebody, it's, it's an awful, awful lot easier, isn't it? In, in that so. sense. I mean, I, th I think, you know, I've thought about it a lot. And people have asked me over the years, probably one of the most important qualities I think you need to run a, run a business and keep it going is stamina. Stamina, yeah, stamina, so. and that, and that and might you might associate that alone with dog food. <clears throat> well, you might, yeah, you might associate it alone with a physical stamina, like a marathon runner. But the mental stamina is a whole different ball game, and I, I, you can still have physical stamina and mental stamina. Of yeah. course, you can, and but that, and it's you, a young man's game as well. And you do need, and it's a bit like the you know, these city whiz kids. Um, they say they burn out after 40 because I suppose they've lost their stamina peak, I suppose, a bit yeah. like an athlete almost. Yeah, you can yeah. overload yourself, can't you, and, and then yeah. suffer from mental stress and so on. Yeah, but yeah stamina and, and, and energy, you know, and, and young people tend to have it more than older people, and you're more risk, you're less risk averse when you're young, you take gambles, and you don't tend to do that so much when you're older. And sometimes those gambles go your way, you know. Yeah, sometimes and sometimes they, they go. How, how, how did you, um, did, did you ever feel like you were running out of stamina at any time, even when it was tough? How did, yeah. Or yeah. did you work harder? Well, mm -hmm. I, I worked harder because I sort of, you know, you, you sort of run out of choices anyway. Once you're in yeah. and you've started, it, it's quite hard to go back to working for someone else again. Yeah. And uh, well, I won't have to do it now, but fortunately I didn't. But there were times when I thought, God, it'd be much easier just to go and get a job. Do a nine to yeah. five. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I've I got my own sort of uh, smallish, well, it's small business, small to medium business, I suppose. Um, I've been the same myself. I've been on the, on the, on the you go and get this, that, that, you're all of the, it's just no fear, you just go and get it, come back. There's not yeah. going to say that there's, there's zero, very little fear and very little um, distraction. You just turn up, do your bit, and I often think I, myself, so. But it is a fine line, and I always say it this way, if you stand, I don't know what the ratio is, but if you stand 20 people against the wall, you're probably fine if you're lucky, one boss, and the other will be 19 employees. Mm. It's the easy route, there's a way to cut out, but fair play to you, you stuck in, um, you've done it, and what did you sell, I think, three successful businesses over your career? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, sort of the same one twice, really, and then another related one. So when I say twice, we sold out. I think the first time in 95 and uh, the, the people that brought us private equity companies or they were called venture capital companies then didn't defaulted on one of the payments because they weren't didn't feel like they got a good deal and they defaulted and we had a clause in the contract if they defaulted we could start up again so we started, they did they did yeah and we, we started up again and that 
that one we sold for a lot of money in 2005, I think. I think it was 2005. So you made it successful, they didn't? Well, they, they you know, I mean, when, when private equity companies basically, you know, work on the basis of, of every 10 companies they acquire, maybe two will do really well, four will make a small profit, and yeah. four will make a loss, or whatever, yeah. don't work. Yeah. And, and they work on it that way, yeah. yeah. So, but no, so no, um, people that bought it the last time did very, very well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, it sold for, the last time I heard it sold for, for about 80 million. It was a different company by then and they'd invested a lot of money in it. But yeah, very good. Well, the thing is, um, you've you done your bit and you, and you left school with no qualifications. I hear this a lot. I, I don't know you people alone. Um, I hear this a lot. Really, really successful people. And it's a, jo it's a job knowing what the right answer is. Example, certain qualifications, you hear these stories now with kids have left with qualifications, young men and women, they go to get employed and there's nothing there and they end up doing a basic job like working in a supermarket. That's yeah. very, very well and out there. But um, I also hear so many people, um, I think one of the blokes, um, is it Wither Witherspoon's pubs? Tim uh, Martin. Tim Martin, he, he left and one of his school teachers said, you won't be very successful, you, you, you know, you left with zero qualifications. Yeah. And um, look at what he's achieved. So. I said, it, it makes you wonder what's the best of quality. I mean, arguably, if you're a doctor, you're a doctor, and yeah. you're going to go out there, and if you're a pilot, you're a pilot. But there's a yeah. lot of industries there where you're where you're still left with the risk factor that you're not guaranteed to be successful. Mm. As, you know, in certain areas. Yeah. But a lot of people do it with without them qualifications. What is it? What is a quick message before we move on to your um, uh, your writing and this? Fabulous, fantastic roller coaster ride you've had doing that in the PP event. Before we move on to that, what is what is the what is the answer? Well, and what was the drive to your success? Well, when I was recruiting people, which obviously you know I've had to do all through my career, um, I I used to ignore qualifications, not be anti people that are qualified, but I just used to ignore it and look for zeal, you know, a bit of go and gumption, which meant a bit up here. Because my dad said to me when when we uh, when I was sort of nervous about going to the Financial Times or going going into the workplace, he said if you, he said if you, when you when you're at work he said if you've got half a brain you'll succeed, he said and if you work hard you'll succeed either one so you could not have a brain but work hard and you'll still get on in life. Yeah. And he said you could not dos but have a good brain you'll still get on in life. He said if you've got both you're clean up, and that gave me more confidence. Uh, I would be okay in the workplace because you know, I'm very nervous about it all. Yeah. And that's what I do. When I used to get people's CVs in, I'll try and look for signs of zeal and gumption. Zeal and gumption. If they had that, yeah. then I'll get them in and in the view. Very good. And that's simple advice. Mine didn't work all the time. No, <laughs> no, I don't I mean, but but if you if you succeed in the ratio of one to ten, if you give a score eight, yeah. you've you've done it. Yeah, if you get one so, good person, they they make yeah. up for thirty. So, so you've cleaned up. I mean, okay, you're not Bill Gates, but you, you retired handsomely, you have a beautiful home, and, and you're able to retire and relax. And that, to me, is clean up. So well done on that. So um, we're, we're going to move on to um, your writing. You had this, you, your parents were librarians, and you, you, you had this passion for writing, but obviously you're busy making a power note. Now, so you've sort of retired and you've got into this sort yeah. of life out dream really of doing some, some writing and let, let, us, um, let us know how, how did your writing start because we've got some fascinating stories coming up here, um, the people he's met, um, it's just fantastic but let's, let's start with that, how did it all? Well I used to sort of write for my own ledger when I, when I was in Bahrain, I got one of those Alan Sugar Amstrad machines with the green first home PC. And you know, once you, you got all excited about buying these things and you had nothing to do on them. Right. And what could you do? Play t tennis on it or whatever. So I had a lot of time on my hands in Bahrain and I just started writing there bits from, from my life, just little little episodes and, and that was that. So it's a sort of diary ish sort of thing. But that, that was when I first started practicing it. I still had no illusions about ever becoming a writer or pub, getting published or anything like that. It didn't even enter my head really. It was for my own satisfaction. But um, back in England, I used to 
I contributed to a couple of Chelsea fanzines, a couple of articles, and got, got, you know, enjoyed that, got a bit of a kick out of it. And I got invited to a 40th birthday party of a friend of mine, Tony Jones. And another guy was there who was a, 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 one of the early sort of Chelsea, Chelsea mob boys called Martin King. And someone had said to him that I wrote a bit, because I've written these fanzine things, and he, he, he's a London taxi driver. God bless him, he's passed away now. And he, he came over to me and uh, he said, I hear you write and all that. He said, I've written a book in my cab. He said, I write it between fares. And he said about, you know, the Chelsea, Chelsea hooligan days and the Chelsea shed and all this stuff. And I used to go to Chelsea, so I knew, yeah. I knew that background. I wasn't a hooligan, but I knew how it all worked and I knew a lot of those people. Old Chelsea fans say that. Yeah, well. So no, no, I'm not a hooligan. No, I'm not a So watch them all go to work on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Anyway, no trouble at Millwall, Chelsea. Never, known, never, never been heard of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I said, "Oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll have a read, it, read of it and tell you what I think." And he gave me this pad, handwritten like your pen here. I thought, "Oh God, I've got to try and read that," you know. And uh, took it home and I started reading it, and it was brilliant, and I loved, absolutely loved it. But it was only about fifteen, twenty thousand words, and for right. a book, you've got to be, a, you know, a lot longer. What would you need, like 50, 60,000? 70, 80. 70, so, 80. So I, I rang him so up. So he's about 20% in, really, more or less. Yeah, but yeah. what he'd done was brilliant. Brilliant and, work, And Because yeah. uh, uh, well, I, I, rang, I rang him up, I said, I really like it, it's great. I said, but we need it to be bigger to try and submit it for publication. Would you let me rewrite chapter one? And if you like what I've done, and if, if you know, it gels with yours and, you know, whatever. And he said, yeah, let's do that. And we did that, and he liked it. And between us, we finished it. Sent it off to... Uh, Sent it off to about eight publishers, and nothing out. He was ringing me every day. I've got a reply yet? I said no, no, not yet, mate. <laughs> you know? And uh, then eventually, this company called Mainstream Publishing in Scotland, they uh, said they loved it. We're, we're, we'll offer you, and I can't remember what it was, but it was a couple of grand advance, yeah. Yeah. three grand, something like that. So I said to mine, yeah, we should take this, and he said no, no, no. He said hang on a bit longer. And so we hung on about a week. And I said, I said, you know, he, he, he's going to withdraw this offer probably if we don't take it. He said, oh, go on and we'll take it. Right. So we took it. And then after that, we got about another five or six offers. And because we'd given our word, yeah. we didn't want you to didn't renege. Want to renege yeah. So ha he was right. If, if, if we'd hung on a bit longer, normally he was the most impatient bloke in the world. Yeah. But business-wise, but, business he, he, but he was right. So I was wrong yeah. there. We could have got more. But didn't really matter. That's the book that became Hulu Fan. Um, how, what was that like in terms of success and book sales? Yeah, very good. Very good. Very good, yeah. yeah. How many sort of copies did that sell then? I don't know exactly, but um, probably 100,000, something like That's that, over good. the year. But it got, it got translated into lots of different languages, Japanese, Korean, Polish. Right. So you don't know how many they sell in those countries. Right. Um, you, you, get, you, you, you sell the, the right to publish it and they give you a lump sum, or they give the publisher a lump sum. But I'd imagine it's been out 25 years, so I imagine by now, I mean, it still sells now. So your first book is up there and out there. So run through, you've done so many books, can you remember them all? Well, I probably could. Cool, no? Um Well, with Martin, we, we, we wrote together for a while, so we did Hulu Fan, Peter Osgood's autobiography. Peter Osgood, With famous, Peter Osgood, which was famous, famous Chelsea, Peter Osgood, Chelsea, Chelsea player. player, yeah. Um, we did, with Martin, did Grass, which was about a guy called Phil Sparrowhawk, who was Howard Marks's partner in crime. Yeah. Although arguably now what they were doing wouldn't be a crime because they were, they were selling grass. Grass, which is now legal. As far yeah. As I, I, I hear. Well, it, it was and it's not. It's done. It's had it's, it's had it's a uh, couple of times where it is and it's uh, not. Parts of America yeah. where where they uh, yeah. did business. It, it, I think it's, it's still. I think, I, think, I think the boxer Mike Tyson does something like sell it, doesn't does he? In a certain I state, I think so. Yeah. Well, that, that was a they say he makes more money that and then than, than he ever did in yeah. boxing. I don't know if that's true or not, but he, he, yeah. there is certain states where it's legal, isn't it? Anyway, yeah. So so, so grass did, uh, on the cobbles with uh, about Jimmy Stockings, which Jimmy you really Stockings, in. You, yeah. fact, you introduced us. Yeah. Um, Battersea Girl, which was about my grandmother's hundred year life, true, you know, based on the truth, but best we could get it. Sounds a fantastic story. That, that yeah. was on my own. Uh, Charlie Cook was on my own. I wrote Charlie Cook, another Chelsea, Chelsea legend. Chelsea legend, yeah. Great winger, uh, well, midfielder. Um, Dave Mackay, who was a smashing footballer for Spurs. Scottish international, was he? Yeah. Very famous picture of him holding up Billy Bremner with Billy Bremner's little legs wiggling. 
Oh, right. Um, <laughs> You're a big strong old boy. Ben Bremner would try to break his leg. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, who else? Football. Oh, George Best. Oh, well, George. George. When we mention football, when we mention George Best, even today, he's arguably, um, you mentioned George Best and Pulley, he just seems to be the most famous two players ever, isn't they? Uh, to me, anyway. Anyway, so George Best, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that. Uh, what else? It's hard to remember that. Uh, more recent, well, Broken Wafers is the book you referred to. We were referring to earlier about my childhood. Yeah. That was the latest one that came out earlier this year. Before that, it was uh, I Ran With The Gang, which was the story of Alan Longmuir, the founder member of the Bay City Rollers. So I got into Fan music Fantastic. Um, yeah. Bay City Rollers, George Best. I've got a couple of stories I've got to come back to on that. Yeah, we'll keep moving. A book called Justice For Joan, which was um, uh, an examination of a real-life 1948 murder in Arundel in Sussex, which uh, remains unsolved, and I did what I could to solve it. Yeah, uh, well done. Um, what else? God. You ever had any awards? Have you won any well, awards as a yes, writer? That's why, I wonder why you're asking that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I co-wrote with you Gypsy Joe, which has been reworked uh, or updated as Kushti, uh, and we got the Observer Sports Book of the Year. There you which go. Was so a, a the great, Observer Sports Book of the Year. A great honour. Um, we mentioned people like George Best and the Basically Rollers and all this other stuff. <laughs> He gets an award from a little old me. <laughs> so it makes me happy. And um, But without that, he wouldn't have had an award. That's his award. So yes, he is an award-winning writer. So we've got all this stuff. There possibly could be some more. Um, let me let me um, touch on um, George Best, Bay City Rollers. But before I go into that, there's um, explain to the people, because I really don't know who he is, and I know what he's about. You explain Alan Silito for me, would you? Yeah. Because you've got a, a, quite a connection here, and it's a, a bit of a fate meant to be. Explain it, please. Well, when I, when, I, when I was a child, and I was very young, eight, nine, whatever, I was a voracious reader, just read, read, read. And I read all the children's books, you know, Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland, all that stuff. Then I started reading Charles Dickens and got into him. And then one day, uh, I was looking for something to read, and my mum and dad used to have library tickets and take books out of the library, and next to her chair was this book called A Starting Life by Alan Salito. So I started reading it, you know, took it, I think I was about nine. I started reading it, and there's like sex in it, and violence and all that, and I thought, bloody hell, you know, this is good. And then she saw me reading it. Yeah. I said, what are you doing reading that? I said, well, you know, it's good. And she said, well, that's actually not his best book. So she said... Um, so you thought you were going to get right telling off, really? Yeah, you no, just no, she encouraged better book. She, right, she, right. she was nurturing me, she encouraged me. She said uh, he wrote two brilliant books, Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, and The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, which many of your viewers will, will know, because they became, or well, they were already, and I, I then got to watch the films when they come on the telly, um, classic British working-class films. Right. Alan Salito was labelled as an angry young man. Right. There was a group of writers at the end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s, and a lot of their stuff got filmed, the L-shaped room and so on, and, and uh, they were called kitchen sink dramas, because most films were not about working class people, you know, so he, yeah. he, he was a, a, a trendsetter. And um, so all his books were set in Nottingham, and I just fell in love with his writing. His writing was just beautiful, wonderful yeah. writing. I recommend anyone now, you know, read, read his books, they're fantastic. And coincidentally, I saw he wrote a letter to, to one of the newspapers one day, I can't remember what it was about, lit libraries or something like that, and it had his address. So I wrote to him, I said, always been a fan of yours, blah, 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 and just wanted to tell him how much he meant to me as a, as a child. And my partner in London Books, my fellow author, John King, who wrote The Football Factory, which became a famous film, Right. Um, he... Uh, he had, he had seen the same letter in the Guardian or whatever paper it was, probably not the Guardian, but one of the one of the newspapers, and he had written to him independently. We had both written to him at the same time. Really? So uh, coincidentally, I'd written his letter to Alan Salito. John King had seen the same letter in the paper and had written to Alan Salito too. Well, another a weird and wonderful coincidence. Yeah, well, a coincidence. And, and you're not partners at this stage in in books. Uh, you and John we, King. We, I'm not sure if we were, but we were certainly friends. By right, then. but you're not. You're not. Yeah, not, not, no. yeah okay. We're certainly friends. But no knowledge of it. You didn't talk to her about no, it over a no, beer or anything. No. He's just done it. You've done it. Yeah, we, we both had discussed with each other how much we liked him, 
Yeah, but you, never, you're John, never John playing this. John had exactly the same experience yeah. as me. He read him as a young boy as well. But it, you're never playing this. We're both no, writing. No. So 69 million people, give or take, in Great Britain. Yeah. You write into him. He writes it to him. So John, I think, said, "Yeah, we'd love to, or I'd love to meet you." And uh, we, we went and met him in a pub called the Lamb and Flag in Covent Garden. You've probably been in there. Lovely little pub. Hit it off, and we became great friends. And yeah. for the last ten I think years, I went in there with you actually once. You probably Lamb did. Flag, yeah. You probably did. Last 10 years uh, of his life, we used to meet probably three or four times a year, go and have a pie and a pint in this pub and he would tell us about his career and encourage our careers and uh, give us advice and everything. He was just such a lovely, lovely man and we became genuine friends, you know. Oh, how yeah, good yeah, really Went around his hat, used to go around his house, meet his wife Ruth. Um, oh, lovely. Share cheese and bread. And it was just brilliant, you know. And, and he, you know, he, he, he's a famous he, writer, he, actor, he, he, somebody you adore. He wasn't interested in fame, but he met all these historical figures. Yeah. You know, he, he, he lived in Mallorca with Robert Graves, who was a famous author. Yeah. Um, and, he, 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 you know, people who made the money, people who made his film went on to make the James Bond films. So in a way, he's responsible for the James Bond film franchise, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... Well, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, that, that's nearly, that's nearly like, like, um... A film. If you if you could take yourself from a little boy, yeah, having that dream, having this. I mean, my, my like, like having the sports idol, wasn't it? Really, you, you're you're all right. You weren't really. You played a bit of football and stuff, but you weren't really a sportsman as such. Yeah. No, not really. So this was more your passion. I mean, my passion was sport. The Bernard Langer, um, who I've met, I haven't met him in that depth, but we, we, we're friends. We say hello. He's quite a shy bloke. Um, but he's my golfing idol. And I'd love to have met um, Sugar Ray Leonard and I would love to have met the great Joe Louis, um, Joe Calzaghe. Um, might, might have an opportunity to all the fighters I really love and admire. Um, but can you see the insight? I can see this a potential as a little boy into writing from an early age, you know, having this fascination about this writing and watching the films and then growing up. Friendship that nearly could make a movie or well, a little book in it, itself, it, couldn't it? Well, the other, the other thing is, I wasn't particularly good at sport, but I, I did play football and I liked football, followed it. And on my bedroom wall, I, 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 I started off as a Palace fan and ended up as a Chelsea fan. But on my bedroom wall, I had pictures of Peter Osgood, yeah, Charlie Cook, Alan Hudson, George Best, because George Best transcended club support. All young people love George Best. If you're playing football on the green when I was a kid, yeah, I'm Georgie Best, you know, you do. You yeah. didn't want to be, oh, most of the other people, you want to be Georgie Best. Of course. And on the other bit of the wall, my brother supported Tottenham, there's pictures of Dave Mackay. So I, I went to bed every night, I woke up every night, looking at these people, and Alan Hudson, who all became, I wrote books with all of them, and became friends. Well, that's, uh, well, that, that, is, you know, that is amazing. You, if, if I was to say to you viewers at home, right, you tell me, I stand corrected, you had these seven or eight idols in your bedroom, and you you want to be a writer and you had written on all of these people arguably or become good friends with them you would have thought that's a water mini story wouldn't you well, I mean, seriously what's the yeah. odds of achieving that yeah well, i stand corrected if i but that's my opinion that is that and it all seemed to happen by that's accident. fascinating it that's got to be a book in that. Is that you, have you never? Well, no, I'm, I'm I'm working on a book at the moment. I might if if which me and my about how I met all these people and and, and different stories outside of the book that we wrote you know different stories about what, what we all got up to and it could be a film it could be a film on my channel seriously yeah. down the line yeah. i mean that would make a fascinating film yeah. i mean I, I do podcasts i do bit you know what i do i do bits of everything because I, I just just like making up um not making up creating creating stories <laughs> yeah making up sounds like it's a lie creating stories but that, that could make for a wonderful mm. little movie or something i love that story so tell, tell me you met so 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 roll off you you this this life of journalism, and you 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 clearly you clearly have a people skill here. From a young age, I meant your book. I'll, I'll go go forward and come back. Broken Wave is your last book. You you met the the kinks, and they give you a beer and a cigarette, and you told him how to get a late drink as early as about eight or nine. So you had this people skill for some who took you to famous people. Uh, but it wasn't only sportsmen and and writers and stuff. You also met many gangsters along the way. You know, um, yeah. people like that. Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, who did I meet? I met, I met Frankie Fraser uh, two or three times. Mad Frankie? Mad Frank. Uh, first of all, I met him with a friend of mine called Mike, who, who, who had some connection to him. And um, I went out for dinner with him one night with uh, 
his wife or girlfriend Marilyn, who who was Tommy Wisby's daughter. Yep. And I think he was trying to persuade see if I would become his co-writer. He, was, he had some very successful books. Yeah. Written with a barrister guy, I think, called James Morton. Right. And I, I think he was trying to work out whether I would write them for a better deal than he's got. With. Yeah. I was told but, Frank he was always trying to knuckle oh, down he? the pound. Yeah. Well, that's what that's what as word has it. I mean, I met him a couple of times, but not in depth. Well, I went to a restaurant with him, and uh, he turned up with uh, the two biggest black eyes you really? know, you've ever seen. He would have been 80 or 75, 80, you know. And he said, I said, well, I'll tell you what happened. He said, uh, I, expect you're, uh, I expect you're wondering where I've got these from. I said, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, well, he said, uh, I, I tripped up on a curb stain, fell over. So I thought, well, normally someone would put their hands out, you know. And anyway, I read in the paper how true this is, I don't know. I read in the paper afterwards that he'd had a spat with Freddie Foreman in a cafe in uh, uh, Clerkenwell. Well, no, I don't know if that's true or not. I, some, I did hear that. Told I, someone else did it. So I that, did hear they had some beef. I don't know if that's the result. Clear, of I mean, it's two seventy-five-year-old men having a fight, you know. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but the people like them don't retire. He was, he was, he was obviously, you know, uh, uh, a very dangerous man in his day. But he, he was very, very charismatic and very funny. Um, Oh, I mean, I, 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 I had my own little story with him. I, I went to see this um, ex heavyweight um, title challenge at Billy Air, Liverpool, London-based Liverpool. Yeah, so, so um, I, I see Billy Air, this, this boxer, we're in the West End, and uh, heavyweight. But Billy's a bigger heavyweight than me. We're both heavyweights, both ex-boxers, both overweight, both big old boys. And I've gone. I knew him from his pub. He had a pub called the Golden Gloves in Sussex. I've gone. Oh, hey, Billy, how you going? He's going, oh, Joe, how you going? So we start making way across the room near the boxing ring on this beautifully chandelier dinner table full of gangsters and faces. And um, so me and Billy charge over I like two elephants equivalent to, to like a, 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 a whippet or something. And the whippet was, frankly, Fraser got in the middle of a tiny man, a small, really small man compared to me and Billy. Yeah. And we were charging like me, if we never collided and knocked him flying, mad Frankie Fraser, we've sent him about seven yards across the floor. And <laughs> Billy's looked at me, and I've looked at Billy, and I know what he's thinking. We haven't said a word to each other, but we're saying, Do you know what we just fucking done? We just knocked Frankie Fraser across the floor. And we're waiting for the reaction. So, Mr. Fraser, I'm very sorry, sir. <laughs> really sorry about that. It's all right, son. I said it's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> he was, he was lovely. I then, I then go in the gents. I'm having a wee. Who stands next to me? Man, Frank. He's on. I'm chatting away, but he's got. He has got. He actually had a couple of bods with him. Yeah. Muscle in the background, and I'm thinking, is this retribution for the actual dental yeah. collision? I was as good as gold. He was a nice fellow. So they, they didn't start trouble that easy. Them blokes, did they? I mean, they I were gangsters. So. No, 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 no. I mean, I. I've, I've been around many people around that stature and they don't start trouble that easy. No. They're, they're actually they're actually quite safe in many ways, you just don't mess around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're allowed to spill a drink, yeah. you're allowed to knock them accidentally over I suppose, but mm. you, you know, you don't go beyond that. <laughs> so tell us, you, you, you had a nice day out with Bruce Reynolds? Yeah, I met Bruce a couple of times. Uh, <coughs> his son was a sculptor and he had, we shared an office. And he had a, a drink drink party once. I met him there, but then I met him after that. We went to a, a book launch, and Bruce was there. And I, I think it was John King that was with me that day. And in this book launch, they only served it was free, the drink, but they only served wine yeah. and bottles of beer. Yeah. And we don't like either me and John. Right. We were talk, talking to Bruce, just chatting away, and very very polite. Dry, yeah. droll man. Yeah. And didn't even say who he was, but we knew who he was. And uh, I think he heard one of us moaning about the wine, or and he said, uh, he said, I fancy a pint of Guinness. Yeah. He said, Would you, uh, you boys, want to come with me? Yeah. Said, yeah. So we'd gone in. We were near the Vauxhall Tavern, but we didn't go in the Vauxhall Tavern. But we found a little pub very close to it. <coughs> and sat down and drank Guinness with him for the rest of the evening. Left, left the book launch. Yeah. Sat down and drank Guinness with him and. Uh, you know, he chatted about his life and a really nice man. Lovely man, yeah. yeah. Your friends are Tommy Wisby? Yeah, well, I met Tommy Wisby 
through Alan Hudson. Uh, him and Alan Hudson became great friends. Yeah. So I met Tommy a few times. He, he seemed a very nice man. Yeah. yeah. He lived over in Islington. I used to meet him at a pub there. For you at home, Tommy Wisby was one of the bank robbers, as was train robbers, train, right? train robbers. Sorry, great train robbery, as was yeah. of course Bruce Reynolds. Yeah, yeah. Are you associated a bit with Joey Poyle, the legendary Joey Poyle? I met Joey a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah nice guy, yeah, Joey. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he just had a book come out when uh, when I met him, or two books, I think. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I made the mistake of sitting on his chair one day. The, the boys wound me up. Yeah, oh, why don't you sit there? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Joey's chair, and uh, he came in, very. Just laughed, you know. And I realised <laughs> yeah. what was going on. It was a wind up. And, uh, it's like you're going in a golf club. Like one of my mates, we used to do it at the captain's golf chairs. Like, don't sit there. I know, I know like a captain of a golf club. I wouldn't be quite as <laughs> fierce as Joey Paul, but they, you know, we used to do it to yeah. our mates. Sit yeah. in the captain's chair. Yeah. But so, uh, yeah, he's a legendary figure, Joey Paul, um, and and, and uh, a nice man. Um, yeah, so you, Ronnie Field, you 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 not seen seen Ronnie? You've knocked around with Ronnie Field a little I bit. Met him a couple yeah, of times. Yeah, yeah, nice fellow. Yeah, yeah. It was strange. As I say, all the experience of these guys, these legendary gangsters. Um, all my experiences. I, I I met Tony Lambriani I just on one occasion. I, mm. I was I was friends with Roy Shaw about. All lovely people. I mean, you never they never ever felt. I think you feel more comfortable than uncomfortable. They're just good. Fellas, really, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, the, tra the train robbers weren't really gangsters, were they? They were they're robbers, aren't they? So it's different, different sort of breed, I think. Yeah, I mean they 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 they, they were, but um, but for sure they were still in the same. Well, they're all, in, they're all in, in that trade. When you're all, you're all doing, <laughs> you're doing twenty years, you know, you get to know people. Oh, of course, the yeah, they, 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 that's what they had. They, they had porridge in common. Yeah, yeah, they all had porridge in common. But yeah, but I mean, vi villainy gangsters. Is, is, it's similar paths, but yeah, it's interesting. Now, um, tell us uh, the, the greatest, the great. To, to me, my dad always said, as a little boy growing up, he said, when you mention football, you mention best. He said, you mention best by name, best by nature. He, a lot of people believe he's one of the greatest footballers to play ever, including Pally. Some say he's up there as well. Mm. So George Best. Now, tell us, you, you you had written George Best's last and latest, very last autobiography before yeah. he passed on. Yeah. And you had something like a six month with him. Yeah, a uh, six month period we did. I didn't see him every day. I mean, I'm, you probably mean once every couple of weeks, but yeah. Yeah. So I had, uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time with him. I'm very lucky because he just had his liver transplant. Yeah. So he was unable to do much. So he was housebound. A tiny, tiny little man he was after this sort of operation. He was, very, was he? Very thin. He's living up in, uh, up the A217 with Alex, his wife. Who, yeah. And, and they were very, seemed to me to be very, very happy. I was very upset when uh, it all broke up. Um, yeah. Because they were devoted to each other, called each other bestie. And she was bringing him in bits of food, little tiny bits of chicken he was eating. So yeah, I got him at a, a time of his life when he was quite reflective and, and a, a prisoner in his own home. So he, he had no choice but to, to deal with me. And uh, the reason I got the gig was two reasons really. One, I knew his manager, Phil Hughes, yeah, who, who, uh, who I'd known for a long time. I met him through Alan Hudson, I think. I can't remember how I met Phil now, but we, we were mates. And also, I lived near George and, and the publisher figured, you know, as I was local, it'd be easier for me. Right. Yeah, fantastic. Any 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 lasting um, memories or moments that stuck yeah, up there yeah, and out there with George? There was a few, a lot of different ones really. Um, one one I remember was uh, we we used to do the I used to take these people. How I did it, I would take them through their lives. Yeah. And uh, tape them. Yeah. And then go home and write up the tapes. Yeah. You know, and and, and the book would form that way. <clears throat> through the tape recording sometimes we get we, 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 as, as George got a bit stronger he wanted to venture out a bit more right. so he, he started going to the gym the local gym and uh, I would meet him in the coffee bit of the gym and say, I, don't, I don't think he was actually training then he may have been but I don't think he was uh, so I'd meet him in the coffee bit of the gym and he'd have his paper out with the, the racing page and he'd be picking out his winners for the day and then I'd get him talking and <laughs> switch the tape recorder on and uh, I was in there one day, and this lady came up in a, in a you know, what they call them, trousers. Uh, they train in joggers, joggers, yeah. and and a, and a t-shirt. She was probably about fifty. Uh, George would have been fifty-eight, uh, roughly at the time, fifty-seven, yeah. fifty-eight, I think. And uh, we were talking, and, and she said, "Oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, hello, George." And I went like that, and I said, "Do you know her?" And she, then she went. I said, "Do you know her?" 
He said, no. So I said, what, what did she put in your pocket? He said, well, I, I, I'll guess, that's her phone number. So he pulled out the bit of paper and he took it and showed it to me. The phone and number. said, Maria, or whatever her name was, you know, yeah. the phone number. I said, what, 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 does that happen a lot? He said, yeah. I said, well, I said, what are you, you going to do? do? You remember, he's 58, he's not like a 25-year-old yeah. man. He said, uh, I'll, 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 and he did, he screwed it up and threw it away. Right. But um, that's, that's what his life was yeah. like. Amazing. It's, um, he said to me... Of um, course, he, he's, his wife was about 20 years as junior, Alex, was, was a beautiful woman. Yeah. And, but George, I suppose, um, he, he had this... Oh, he's a good-looking man. Good man. Very good-looking man. Was um, do you think his attraction then was he's, he's recovering from his health problems? Was was he still a good-looking man, or or was it just his fame? Where do you think this sort of telephone number come yeah. from? Was that from from his fame and power, or his looks, or, or both? Or well, I don't know if he, if he wasn't George Best, it never happened to me. <laughs> yeah. but, um, you know, yeah. I, I, I think I mean George was a good-looking man, and he was a charismatic man, and he was very very humble, quiet, and I could see why women liked him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, lovely eyes. And yeah, well, I think his son, no, but his son was yeah, become Callum, a male model, Callum, Callum, didn't he? Who looked very much like his dad. Yeah, good looking, good looking yeah. boy. Yeah, so I suppose, um, I suppose it, you know, it arguably, um, but I suppose all the press, I mean, he, he, he dated um, Mary Stavin. Um, That's right, yeah. Uh, uh, Miss World. And Marjorie I suppose, Wallace, another Miss World. Yeah, so Miss, uh, Miss Worlds were at his feet, so I suppose um, it's no real surprise yeah. that. Maria, as you call her, home, yeah. you know, in the nicest way, possibly attractive woman, but Joe blogs up the road the same the same attraction. I don't yeah. know, but it's a fascinating story. And and tell us how did how did um, your relationship and the end end well, with George? Well, so you completed his book. You done you done we, that. We completed stuff. the book, and uh, it, it, it was coming out. And he was getting stronger by the day. He was getting stronger and stronger by the day, and. Uh, uh, I went round there one day, and Alex answered the door. She said, I'm sorry, but he's gone out. And I was a bit put out, you know, I had arranged to meet and whatever, and, you know, he'd gone out. And I said, well, where's he gone? She said, well, I, I don't know. She said, but I wouldn't mind betting he's in the betting shop in Cheen, Cheen Village, near where we live. So I went down there, gone in there, sure enough, he's in there. And it's full of cigarette smoke. You can still smoke in, in, in those days, yeah. yeah. It's full of cigarette smoke, machines whizzing and whirring. Lots of banter between the men, no women in there. And I thought with myself, you know, what, what are you doing in here, sort of thing. And then I realised it was the closest to a pub he could get without alcohol. Yeah. And and I sort of tumbled that the, the old desires were possibly coming back. And then what happened was the publisher, uh, Random House, or Ebury Publishing, I think, did the book. They, um, they arranged a tour, a book signing tour, which was going to go to some of the big cities, you know, Liverpool, Manchester, Belfast. And I was invited on it, so you know I thought this is great. This is like touring with the Beatles or someone. You know I couldn't, couldn't, yeah. couldn't, I couldn't believe how my life was turning out. And the first gig, uh, the first signing was at a, a shop in Canary Wharf. All right. And, and me, George, Phil, his manager, and a cab driver called Pedro who used to drive us everywhere, took us up there. And we got to Canary Wharf. I didn't really know Canary Wharf that well. Uh, because it all sort of took off after I left the city. Really. It all changed a lot, didn't it? Yeah, but anyway, we're driving down this road and there's a queue going all the way down the road, all the way, you know, couldn't believe it, like, like they're queuing for a football match. Right. Except they were like ladies and men in suits and things. And um, he said, what's this queue for? I said, well, that's for you, that's for the signing. He went, no. I said, yeah, and he was so chuffed, I saw his little chest you know, puff out. He was really couldn't believe because he thought people might have gone off him because so, of the transplant. Yeah, they were okay. taking the, You know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, um, we got in there and sold you know, hundreds of books. It, it went on from twelve o'clock to half past two or something. Right. Like that, or half eleven to half two, three hours. And girls are coming up getting their t-shirts signed and photos and every, everything you can imagine. And. Uh, he, he absolutely loved it. I could just see him blooming as it was going on. Yeah. No one said a bad word to him and he was really, really happy. And he said, um, at the end of it, we're packing up. And he said, uh, oh, I've seen a coat I want to buy on the King's Road. I'm going to get on a bus and uh, buy it. So Phil said, well, don't be silly, George. You know, if you really want it, we Pedro will drive us home that way. You can jump out and, and we, we'll buy it. So he said, no, no, I'm all right. And he, and he waved and that was my final image of him. 
He waved and he sort of went into the crowd and just disappeared. He, I mean, he, he had no idea where to catch a bus from. He hadn't been on a bus in 50 years, you know. No, well, he probably would with, with, with his notoriety. He, 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 he hadn't seen any chauffeurs. coat. He was on a high and he wanted to go out. And uh, I then went up to my place up in Norfolk and I got a phone call. I think the next day, and my mate said, Are you, have you got Sky up there? I said, no. He said, oh, right, well, on Sky, George is holed up in a pub in Walton on the Hill. I can't think of the name of it for a minute. And all the cameras were out, you know, he, he got, fell off the wagon. He, yeah. he was on the drink. And all the cameras were outside and, you know, they were speculating about him and Alex and God knows what. And like live coverage you get now from the Ukraine, you know, just George, yeah. George Best in a pub. And um, yeah, he went back drinking and, and within a year or two of that, I don't know how long it was. And their marriage then sadly failed. The, the marriage failed and he, well, he, he, he died, um, which was really sad. Yeah, sad. Because that, that was a marriage... Um, you're normally a younger woman, fame, fortune. You, you, I think you told me somewhere before that there was madly in love. I mean, she's a beautiful woman. That's what I felt. Yeah. That's what I felt. And yeah. uh, I, I never would dream that that would break up, you know. Well, but, she was but, loyal but, but, through that period of him getting better and course, having the liver. So, course, so you obviously need a lot of care. Yeah. So that f fantastic story. Now, you've met all these musicians you've met, actors, you've met gangsters, you've met sportsmen. You've met hard men. You've done all that. Give us an highlight um, in your career of writing. What it's led to. Well, one of the more recent. They're, they're, they've all been highlights. You know, I mean, when you first meet some of these, your, 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 your childhood idols is, uh, you know, just a, a phenomenal feeling, really. And and they say you should never meet your your heroes. That's a saying. Yeah. I've met loads of them. But you haven't done too bad by it. Well, I, 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 not one of them's disappointed me. Oh, that's very good. You know. But, um, yeah, I was fortunate enough to write Alan Longmuir's autobiography with him. And Alan Longmuir was the founding member of the Bay City Rollers. Now, the Bay City Rollers weren't my cup of tea as a kid. It wasn't my music scene. But I got involved with him and he was the loveliest man, one of the loveliest men I've ever met. And uh, I used to go up to Edinburgh and... Uh, do the same thing with the tapes with him and, and all that and really really tragically he died in the middle of us doing this book oh, he, went, he went to mexico and uh he fell ill out in mexico and uh he died you know they got they got him back to scotland but he, but he died but um the book we, you know i finished the book without him uh we we, we, we you know we'd done over half of it but I finished it finished it without him but it was very sad very poignant but um just to pause you there yeah for the younger viewers, I'm sure the older viewers would know, but basically Rollers are a massive, massive group pushing on the heels of the Beatles. Yeah, I yeah. mean, they were a different sort of group to the Beatles. They were like more of a teeny bopper. Uh, Bye Bye Baby was their Bye Bye Baby was the most famous song. But what I didn't know, and I you know, learned to appreciate it, was that they had their, they were like the biggest thing in Britain in about 1974, 75, 76. So we're a little bit post Beatles then, half a decade oh, yeah, ten, or so, ten, years, ten, years, ten years after the Beatles. Yeah. But for the two or three years, they were the top band in Britain, yeah. commercially. Yeah. I'm not saying they were the best band, but they were commercially, you know, the top no, band. I like their stuff. They're, they're, everyone dressed, not everyone, but a lot of people dressed like them and, and so on. And they used to go on stage in a tartan gear, and I think they're Edinburgh based band, weren't they? they? Are. Yeah. But what I didn't appreciate, after their success in Britain started to wane a little bit, uh, punk rock came in that didn't help them and as, as it started to wane a bit they, they smashed it big time in america did they and not many bands i mean the beatles smashed it in america the stones did but not many bands smashed it they had their own tv series really they were massive so while they were on the wane over here they were on the way they were smashing there. it in america yeah and then when it waned a bit in america they were smashing it in the in the in the far east in, in terms of china or well, hong kong australia new zealand really became massive so, so they're just J successful Japan, all the way yeah so they, they, they were a massively successful band and they were much more talented than people realised. They started writing their own songs. But, you know, they, they were little kids. I mean, Adam was a little bit older, but Woody, uh, you know, was about 15 or 16 when... when oh, they were just boys. They were yeah. boys. Yeah. Thrust into that world. It's a wonder, you know... That they, they survived them. That they survived it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so the story about uh, Adam was um, a, a guy called Liam Rudden up in Edinburgh, a very, very good journalist... He, he wrote a stage play called I, I Ran With The Gang, which is what I also called the book, or we are called the book. 
and it was a celebration of the Bay City Rollers and it was on in a small theatre in, in Edinburgh and um, Alan used to appear in it now and then and I think they got Les McEwen in it a couple of times and so on. Anyway, I, I went to one of them and we arranged that I would read the final, almost the final paragraph of the book and it's where Alan is appreciating his fans and sort of contemplating his mortality and of course it became much more poignant because he did actually die right you know before that came out it went, of course he had no idea that was going to happen to him yeah so i've read that out on stage to i don't know two or three hundred people and they were these were girl, ladies who would have been girls when the rolls were out yeah and i could see in the front row girls were crying as i was or ladies were crying as i was reading it out really and then when i finished i, I was like in tears and and the uh the whole place stood up and you know, gave me a standing ovation and it was just the, the feeling was fantastic i can nearly feel it myself yeah and i can made, imagine you can get there yeah yeah and i've made friends with um, his friends you know and he had a local pub and uh you know he, they all knew, they all knew him and uh, i got to know them and i'm still friendly with him now i'm hoping to go back up so oh very good very good now the pandemic's over very good that sounds good. wonderful well if you need a, a show for an reminder yes yeah, yeah you're i'm it. sure i'm sure yeah. um you, you can you speak scottish Aye. <laughs> See you. No, no yeah. problem. Aye. <laughs> That'll do. We drum. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, sp I've spent that. Uh, we drum, I don't know. No. See what you think. I don't, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Um, no, I've spent a bit of time in Edinburgh myself. Oh, right. Edinburgh's fantastic. Yeah, I've right. even been to their prison. It's wonderful, wonderful, oh, wonderful I remember prison. The, yeah, yeah lovely, lovely little prison smashing, they got smashing there. Place, really they nice feed you free, free meals a day, but very small portions. No good for a big, heavy guy. If you're a big, heavy guy, keep away from the prison in Edinburgh. It's not very good. Funny enough, yeah. Alan's nickname in the pub was Shang, from the song Shang Alang, which is another yeah. one of their big hits. Yeah. You know, so you walk in the pub, they, they didn't even refer to his, you know, they, did, they just knew him as Alan, or as Shang, their mate. Yeah, you know. really. There was no, no like... Uh, yeah, well, it sounds like it's a, a wonderful story, but a sad story. Did you get any of the old... Um, now you're sort of part of the fan club, and now I'm most uh, supported by girlies. Did you get any of the old George Best bits of paper in your hand? No. No. No, and I kept pointing to the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful story, and, and I can see the eye come in there. So we're just going to... I'm going to briefly touch on, on, you, on your book, your latest one. You've got, you got one you're working on, but your latest one that's out is Broken Wafers, which I, I have read. I... I would describe Broken Wafers, it's Martin's, explain a little bit um, why it's called Broken Wafers. Yeah, so the book is about my childhood from being born to when I was left school, that financial times thing I, I said, um, and I wanted to write it because I'm beginning to forget stuff, you know, and I wanted to try and capture that era before it's gone from everyone's memory, because yeah. I'm getting on now. Yep. So uh, Broken Wafers was when the ice cream man would come around almost every day, so certainly in the summer, maybe not in the winter. And he was called Peach Bar, our ice cream man. Lovely, Peach lovely Bar. Italian man with a, with a bald head. And uh, um, the, the thing was, we did, you know, your mum and dad could probably afford to buy you an ice cream once a week. Yeah. We'll give you the money for an ice cream. They couldn't do it every day. Right. Especially when there's five or six kids. Yeah. You know, it's a lot Understandable. Of yeah. So and most of the kids were in the same boat. You, you, no one really could afford an ice cream every day. Right. So um, he would come in with his playing in screen sleeves or whatever they were playing on the old ice cream man. And uh, I got sent over by the older boys to ask for any broken wafers. So what he would do, he'd have a bag full of wafers for the ice cream that are supposedly are broken. And he'd give them to me. And I'd walk back to the gang, sit on the green. <laughs> we'd, we'd eat these broken wafers. Yeah, the broken know, we thought wafers. we'd have a result. Yeah. But now looking back on it, I wonder whether it was an investment in the future. So you just smashed up with a little hammer yeah a few wafers yeah because <laughs> sooner or later we'll be getting pop paper around money and uh yeah did, yeah you yeah. know look at that yeah pre pre and, and, for and the future i thought it was only us that did it yeah i've now learned when you know it was national wide every, everyone was asking for yeah, broken yeah, wafers yeah really amazing so, uh, yeah good story well i can tell you i've read um broken wafers myself and um i thoroughly enjoyed it and it really does take you back a trip down memory lane when we talk about you know Gullens, cigarettes, points when we used all that metric, although we were in the um, era of before decimalisation, but it just takes you back when the half day closing, yeah. um, the school, but it just takes you all the, the way back, stuff we don't realise, pre-mobile phones, and I found it a wonderful journey and a very, very, um, very humorous read and it kept me very interested so i thought it was a wonderful read um broken wafers so Thank if you're you. contemplating it um 
grab it from London Books. I think now you you are a part owner, a joint owner of London Books, yep. which published Broken Wafers and yeah. many other books. Um, tell us, how does uh, London well, Books work? London, London Books was formed by myself and John King about 12, 12 13, maybe more years ago. And its real aim, its main aim, is to republish old London literature that's gone out of favour, gone out of print. Yeah. Um, again, we both had this uh, love of all these old, all these old books, most of them written in the nineteen thirties, nineteen forties, and that's what we really do. Yeah. Um, and one of the advantages is the authors are dead, so we don't have to pay them a royalty. And uh, yeah, we we, some, we we normally get a, a contemporary person to write an introduction to the book. And, and it washes its face. Yeah. You know, there's not a big market for it, but we love doing it. Yeah. And we've met loads of people for yeah. doing it and had lots of fun. Good. Um, and that's what it is. And, uh, you know, uh, Broken Wafers I published because I probably wouldn't have got a publisher. Yeah. So we did it through London Books. Um, they're niche audiences and yeah. publishers these days are getting much harder and harder for an author. Yeah. A new author to break through. Break through, yeah. And get published because... And you've got your own platform there, come what may, if need Well, be. we have, we yeah. have, but yeah. it, it, it is really just for the London classics, which is yeah. the, the, the old stuff. Very good, it sounds great as well. When you mentioned London, um, arguably, I think, the greatest city in Europe. Yeah. yeah maybe the world. <laughs> yeah. And you mentioned London books. So, um, yeah, so so there's been a, been a fantastic roller coaster. Not really, well, it has been a bit roller coaster with the up and down from the humble working class background to on the brink of failure in business. You 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 got up there and you made it very successfully as a businessman. You've now made it successful as a writer. You've made met these wonderful people. That hasn't been so turbulent. Obviously, some books are more successful than others, but it hasn't been turbulent. That's just been living out a dream, and that's been up there and out there. So what keeps you motivated now? We still got a strong drive for the books. Is it the grandkids? Is it seeing the kids through their careers? What really keeps you motivated on a daily basis? That's a good question. Yeah, well, it's, it's a mixture of all of that. Um, I have now got five grandchildren. We waited a long time for grandchildren, and uh, they're now coming in. Like, like buses, like, are they? Yeah, like buses. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think we'll probably end up with ten or eleven. The yeah. way it's going, I've got yeah. five children. Good. Some of them haven't even spawned yet, so yeah. you know, God knows. Uh, so uh, that is write, writing. Uh, I want to I want, obviously want to write more if I can, um, but I only want to write stuff I want to write because I don't, you know, don't really need to. Yeah. But I am finding it harder. Uh, the age is creeping up, and uh, the brain's not as agile as it was, and I find it harder to concentrate. So that you're battling these things. So I suppose what makes me now, I want to make the best of what, however many years. I've got left, I hope it is years, um, I want to travel and I want to enjoy my family and uh, that's it really, stay, stay alive if I can. And potentially, um, I think we mentioned somewhere in chatting prior to this in a general conversation because me and Martin, as you probably quite obviously understood, he had um, the giant wrote my book and published and um, actually made him an award winner. He made me an award winner, so we rub off, we become very good friends. But then you say you, you wouldn't mind doing um, potentially, and only potentially, a comedy um, type of, as you call it, sitcom. You wouldn't mind getting one series out there as a writer to write one, put it on something like a YouTube channel potentially, and or just to write for, for a, a, a productive team. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've, I've written a couple of scripts, neither yeah. of which have got published. Um, I did a, an episode of Only Fools and Horses uh, when David Jason appealed to the public for someone to write one. Yeah. A final episode, when, and I showed you it. And, uh, I read it and I thought we, it was a we, fantastic script. We hand delivered it to David Jason's house, but we never really. We did. Uh, we did. We had we had um, we had a, a day of because we're Martin's retired, or semi-retired. I'm my own boss, so I can get my own time off here and there. And um, we went to Sir David. Jason's house and we delivered it and it did get a reply didn't you? I did in the end yeah. And it was a bit of fun and we went to yeah. see um, we went to see the same day we went to see the, the um, bridge of the great train yeah, robbery. Yeah. So we had a bit of fun there but no you're, you're wonderful yeah, so right, but you never know somebody sorry to over no. talk somebody uh, uh, watching could say well Martin's a successful writer um, okay I'll knock sync up for me so you never know if you yeah. don't mention these things. And, and I wrote a couple of screenplays of uh, <laughs> Well, a screenplay for the another book I forgot to mention, which was about the murder of a policeman in Epsom in 1919 in a riot. I mean, can you believe that? A riot in Epsom, street riot. 
but that, that's a little well, bit... Well, I can, more. coming from a town like that. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but the, the... When you earlier said there's more nutcases... No, but they weren't there then. Oh, the right. hospitals weren't there then. Yeah, but the nutcases... Well, they, well, they were there, but the just... The nutcases were. <laughs> yeah, well, there was Canadian soldiers, actually. But anyway, so I wrote a... a there was a, a modicum of interest from someone who worked in television. So I wrote a script, but it never got it never got made. So I really, going back to your question, I really love writing scripts because yeah. it's a totally different skill, totally different discipline. You've got to imagine one, one you've got a cost in mind all the time. Yeah. So you can't have you know huge backdrops. Huge, you know, you can't say that you know we're filming this bit in Cuba and we're filming this bit in Hong Kong or whatever. Yeah. You can't do it. Um, so you've got to be mindful of the cost. And and you got and it, and it plays out in your head. You can see it as a film or a television program, and and it, it's an art. I'm not saying I'm good at it. I'm, I'm obviously I'm not because I haven't got anything out there yet. It's not quite that easy though, is it? I'll, I'll give you um, the viewer at home um, some idea. I've probably now been asked to do six six pieces of TV work, one which come very near to being a big TV series. And I've, I've been on television several times, other than my own channel. But I've never, the TV's a very, it's a strange, strange industry. Yeah, we want you on Channel 4. Example, I'm not saying Channel 4, but or whatever the channel may be, all right? Um, yeah, you're there filming, uh, uh, your piece didn't make it. And then when you look at the piece you got replaced for, it seems much better. It's a very, very, it's a bit, of, it almost looks a bit like a lottery. You've got to have the right... You've got to touch the right nerve to the right director or the right pusher, yeah, and you're away. So I, I don't think it's got anything to do with your writing, in my opinion, because I've seen you writing the script from no, Falls and no, Horses. I thought was wonderful. Half joking, really, but you'd better have been in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I, I, I think um, what we could do is get something, put it on Cushy TV. Get it up there and out there, and then if somebody these, these um, make it picked up, you know, right? if Sky or Netflix want to come along, then take it off yeah. my um, minnow but fast growing channel. Who knows? But you've got the credentials. That could be a winter project. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any regrets during your career? Before we wind down, have, 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 is there been anything that you? Um, not really, to be no. honest with you. I mean, I didn't. My, I've got five children, and they came in two bursts, and the first three children, because I was always working, and my job involved working nights because we as the papers came off the presses we read them and cut out the articles and assembled them and sent them out to our customers so i spent the early part of their lives being on nights so they never really saw me you know very and i didn't take a holiday for many many years yeah and, and that's how it was it was drudgery really looking back yeah. on it um and and we had no money you know we, we were living sort of hand to mouth really well that's not the exaggeration but you know we we didn't didn't have much money. We weren't earning much money out of the yeah. company. Couldn't take the money out of the company. Um, and um, so I slightly regret that I wasn't around for their infancy as much as I should have been. But then the reward was at the other end. We had a nicer lifestyle in the, in their teens. And, yeah. And the two young ones, was it two or three? Two young ones, Daisy and Joe. Yeah, Daisy and Joe. Um, they... Um, they, they enjoyed a much more, saw, saw me much more and um, a much more enjoyable lifestyle. It's not a regret because if I hadn't have put those hours in. Yeah, no, I, I see, um, I, I've had this with, with my wife because I, I too got five children and, and we brought up my cousin um, mm. for about, well, well, I mean, about seven, eight year mm. old, so I've included a six for five of her own. Um, my wife says to me, yeah, but you spent more time, I said, but yeah, but when you got one child, it's, we needed less money then as it went up we expanded to five children we needed to take a different direction to make more money yeah. and it's just I think it's a father's survival skill yeah. you you know if you're a proper man and a proper dad you, there's a sense of you are the hunter you've got to go out and provide mm. it's a sense of the animal in mm. us that we've got to go and provide mm. and if it takes more hours it's what it is and yeah. um, but it's nice that you reap the rewards now and you're setting your oldest son up in business and he's doing nicely and uh, reap, reap the rewards and um hopefully after you live to 100 nice he's done that himself my oldest son has he yeah yeah, yeah. Done very well. he's worked hard but on on, yeah. on your knowledge yeah, I was there. In, in the same I, I field. Was, I was there in the early years. In the same field? Yeah. Uh, similar field, but it's, similar. it's very different now. Different, but similar. Very different. Yeah. Well, that's good. So it's, it's worked though, but um, yeah. Um, but either way, you set him on the path. Yeah. 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 
Um, so what's your advice out there to any wannabe young writer, to your fans at home, um, what's the advice out there you would give that somebody wants to strive to be a successful businessman or a writer? Um, any advice out there? Well, to keep at it, um, funny enough, I wrote to a famous author when I was a kid called Dennis Wheatley. And yeah. I, and I asked his advice, but I didn't have any intention of being a writer. I just wanted an excuse to write to him because I loved his books. Right. And he said, only write about what you know. Right. Otherwise you get caught out. Well, all his books were about black magic, Satanism, you know, uh, espionage, historical novels. I thought, well, you're writing books about stuff you don't know, you know, about what? Yeah, well, it, have, it sounds like you must have had a uh, twisted, yeah. twisted life. I mean, no, the only advice I would give if, if you, you know, if you like doing it, do it. Yeah. You know, you, don't, don't, you can't just sit and say, right, I'll be a writer and then try and learn how to like it. You've got, you've got, you've got to be have a passion. Well, I think that's sound advice, isn't it? Because it's often said, isn't it? If, if yeah. you enjoy your job, you're halfway there, aren't you? Oh, definitely. And definitely. business, what's the, what's the driving motive for somebody without any qualifications? Is it the old simple one that your dad given? I, I would say, I would repeat that, yeah. Work hard, have you got a little bit half, a little bit, we don't need to be usually educated, just, just half educated, well, put the effort in. Tell, you know, but just being a bit of gumption, really. Yeah. You know, having a bit of gumption. I don't quite know where the saying, God loves a trier, comes from, but it's often said, isn't it? Yeah. God loves a trier. Yeah. And um, so, and let's, I'm sure he does, because yeah. we are we are taught to work by our Bible. We're only, we're only here once, aren't we? So if you've got a dream, you should, you should at least try to achieve it. You chase it. Well, it's lovely to have. I, I have a sporting dream, and I'm still still chasing you know, and yeah. it's lovely to have, and I said this, what, what a wonderful thing to have a dream to chase, and yeah. whatever, whatever, however high you climb that tree, it's nice to have something to chase, isn't yeah. it? Mr. Martin Knight, it's been absolutely all my pleasure on Push TV. so you remember to click and subscribe, and um, yeah, if you want to look at Broken Wafers, his latest book, or any other books that he's done, but um, Broken Wafers, I can say, is a good read. Yes, um, you can get in touch via any feedback via London Books or any books you're interested in. Or you might need to ask him a question. You might be a young entrepreneurial writer and they'll give you some advice and get in touch with you via London Books. Yeah. 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 Lovely. So, Mr. Martin Knight, thank, thank you very you. much. Sure. Uh, it's all my pleasure. You click subscribe. You keep on subscribing and I'll keep giving. In the meantime, you take care. Well done. He was good. Very